Hi everyone. This week is the introduction to matte surface tonal rendering using grey markers only and it's going to be the first exercise of Sketching Portfolio 2. You can download and print the layout for this exercise from Canvas under our workshop class week 6 and this rendering is going to be there for your reference as well. Just like with perspective sketching, with marker rendering it's important to start with the fundamentals. And before we render more complex objects with different textures, material finishes and colour, we're going to start with grey tone marker rendering. That way you get to learn to control the mediums and communicate the form and volume and shape based on light source with good impact and contrast. So before we start rendering any sketch, we need to make two decisions. One is the light source direction and the light source angle and that'll help determine where our highlights are, where our shadows might be and any reflected light that we might have. For any rectilinear volume such as this cube, we have what we call a 1-2-3 read. 1 being the highlight surface, 2 being the mid-tone surface and 3 being the shadow side surface. With conical, cylindrical and spherical forms, we still have a highlight, mid-tone and shadow side, but obviously they are distributed across a curved surface. So if we have a look at this cone where the we can see the highlight, we can see mid-tones and we can see shadow. But what helps us communicate something that is conical is the fact that there's some reflected light hitting the surface that turns away from us. Similar on the cylinder, there's our highlight, there's our mid-tone, there's our shadow tone, and there's our reflected light. This shadow tone on the cone, cylinder, and the sphere, we refer to this as the core shadow. Okay, so that's at the point where it will turn into shadow, but of course, reflected light to help communicate that it's a surface that's turning away from us. And as these are just matte surface renderings, we're going to use white pencil for our highlights so that we can get smooth transitions. And we're going to use black pencil to enhance the transition from shadow core through our mid-tones. White pencil is going to identify the highlight on our edges, our leading edges, as well as black pencil for the radius that turns on the underside of these surfaces. Okay, so here I have a clean trace off on bleed proof paper using my Copic Multiliner and I've just printed out the layout of the exercise, used it as an underlay and traced it off. Uh, quite happy for this exercise for you to just use some templates, a straight edge, circle guide and ellipse guides if you've got them. And um, you'll notice that the leading edges I've kept really light. So that would be this Y shape on the leading edge of this cube and the top edge of the cylinder. Throughout this rendering, I'm going to be using a 1, 3 and 5 grey marker, a 0.5 multi-liner and a black and white pencil. I'm actually using cool greys here and those of you that bought the Copic kit for this subject, um, you guys have toner grey markers. So I'm using the same light source direction as the sample I showed you earlier, as well as the same light source angle for all of these objects. And we're going to start to build value and shape and form with our lightest tone being the C1. I'm going to start off with the cube, given that that's uh, the flat surfaced uh, volume that we've got here. The top surface would be my lightest surface. Cool grey one or one is actually really light, so you can just block that in. And I'm actually going to overlay each stroke to eliminate some of the stripes. You can always come over and give it a second pass. The beautiful thing about using bleed proof paper is it allows you to get a nice sharp edge uh, with your marker. I'll continue on on my mid-tone surface. Um, you'll see me following the direction of my perspective, which is going to the left vanishing point. And when I get to the edges, I actually drop down, then across, down, 
across, down, across. Don't worry about making a mistake because this, uh, this rendering is going to get somewhat darker. But I do want to fill pretty much all of those white spaces. Because I know that this uh, right vertical face is my shadow side, I could continue with my C1, but I want to save a little bit of ink because this is going to get considerably darker. So I'll just switch straight to, or go straight to, my C3. Even with markers, you want to defer to your clean, accurate strokes. And then here, I'm just going to block in. I'm overlaying. This will eventually be a five, but what I am doing is just building, creeping up on my contrast. And I'm actually straight away doing a second pass. And markers have what they call a wet line. So you actually, while the ink is still wet, if you do multiple passes, it tends to dry as a solid block. A second pass on my mid-tone. Okay, maybe even give that a third pass. So with the top surface, I actually want this front edge to appear to be closer to us because the light source is going to be hitting this front edge. So I'm going to grade from the back forward. So I'm going to use my C1 again. You can see how it's slightly darker because it's the second overlay. And then I can go back again with my C1 and go and come a little bit more forward. And that'll give me that transition, that gradation from the back to the front where it's slightly darker, brighter at the front. I'm going to now jump to my five and bring up all the contrast that I'm after. What I'm also thinking about is that there may be some reflected light coming off the surface that this block is sitting on. So I'm just going to grade it slightly, just like what I did to that top horizontal surface. So it appears to be a little bit darker just at the edge that it turns to horizontal. Now that that's much darker, I can use my three and punch up my mid-tone surface. But we have a good one, two, three, read. Let's have a look at the cylinder and the cone. They share the same diameter at the base. We know that the light source direction is from this angle, and we know that the light is coming from the top at that angle. I'm going to establish where that shadow core is. And very lightly, you know, it's if we look at this width and say it's about a third the center of that shadow core, I just drop one line in. And that's going to be the shadow core that I build from. I'm also going to have a smaller shadow core on the far side here. And you can see, if you uh, practice your straight line, you're going to use that same skill for when you do your marker work. On the cone, because it shares the same diameter, I'm going to have the same position, which is about here. But of course, with the cone, it's going to taper to a point. You can rotate your nib so that you can choose the fine point or the chisel. I'm just going to roll to the edge and then just drop in one line that goes straight to that point. So that's my marker. That's my positional. Then, of course, we're going to have a smaller shadow core on the left side. I'm going to use the same sharpness of that chisel nib and just go straight to that point. So I can just build the width because it should taper. And if I make a mistake, that's totally fine because I'm using a light, light gray and then start to establish contrast with your darker markers later. Same with the cylinder, straight up and down. 
I look at the thickness and position of that shadow core. I want this to be a little bit wider so it's the same proportion. But see, I'm just building my volume and I'm actually also creating smooth transitions just with this light marker. Now, watch what happens when I start to render this minor shadow core. And if I start to move it to the right, it starts to set up the position of my highlight. So what we don't want to do is go too far to the center because then the light, the highlight will be dead center. So to have that highlight offset on the third of the width of this cylinder would look quite nice, similar to what's going on here. Okay, there's my highlight. That top surface is parallel to the surface of this cube, and that is also our lightest read. I'm gonna flat block that. So now I'm gonna go for some more contrast in the shadow core areas and then blend it to the highlight on both the cylinder and the cone. I've got my C3 here, and I also have my C1 in my palm. Because what I want to be able to do is blend while this ink is still slightly damp. So I drop in a couple of passes of this C3, right in the middle of that shadow core. Get my C1 and blend left and right. We're going to be using a C5 as well, so don't worry if it gets a little bit streaky because there are ways to make it smooth. But you can see I've increased the contrast of that shadow core. Going to do the same here, using the chisel edge of my C3, C1, blend. You can see how I want that edge on the left to stay light because it's a cylinder. It's going to roll away from us to the left there. Okay, and I'm very wary of this highlight position. I do not want to lose that position. Coming across to the cone, C3, right in the center, all the way through it to that point. And then build width. Because it's a triangle down the base, isn't it? C1. Blend. C3, minor shadow core on the left. C1, blend. And you see I spend a bit more time down the base here because I want it to be triangular shaped. I do not want to lose that highlight position. I can come back again with my C3 to the darkest area of my rendering. Nice straight line. C1, blend. Smooth transitions, good shape, accurate position of the highlight. At the top, just like what we did to the top of the cube, I'm gonna start at the back, probably to about halfway. This is my C1, then I'll go to the back again and come forward even closer to this leading edge, and we'll get a transition from dark to slightly lighter. I can see the darkness of my shadow side on my cube, and that's as dark as I'd like my shadow core to be on both the cylinder and the cone. So C5 with C3 near me, so that I'm not rummaging around looking for my C3. This is a darker value marker. Go to the darkest part of your rendering, Smack bang in the center of that core value, then three, blend. You just want to blend that transition, sorry, that um, C5 that you put down. Then I picked up a, uh, my number one and I'm blending three to my highlight. There's my smooth transition. And look how much contrast we get in that shadow core compared to my shadow side on the cube. So we want to keep that deepness consistent. I'm going to move over to my cone now. This is C5. A bit 
thicker down the bottom because it's a triangle or conical form. C3, blend. Just where it, that um, number five finishes and starts to go light. Then one and push the dark ink across and you'll get the smooth transitions. I'm going to do it again for my shadow core on the cylinder. Notice I went straight to the darkest part of my rendering. Grab my three, blend. To the left and to the right. Grab my one, blend. And this is the first time I'm actually going to go straight through that area that was just plain paper white. The minor shadow core on the left, smack bang in the center of where that was dark. This is a five. Here's my three. Don't go too far left or right because we don't want to kill this highlight position. Here's one. And look how smooth that is starting to transition and set up my highlight. Okay, so minor core on the cone, left hand side. Straight to that point, a little bit wider down the bottom. Get my three, blend. Get my one, blend. And just by one or two passes of that one, because that ink was slightly wet, gave me a smooth transition to highlight. You have to evaluate as you work, as you go along, right? So this is telling me that I can afford to make that far side of that top surface of the, of the cylinder a little darker and bring that forward. But I also know that I'm going to enhance this rendering with um, black and white pencils. So don't have to overdo it. I'm going to give now my shadow side of the cube another pass and that'll bring that contrast across to these three views. This is a five. So I guess for this exercise we'd like to see that these three objects are matte surface finished. They are all the same color and they are all the same tonal range. Right, so I'm pretty happy with um, the tonal range and the shaping of those three objects. And we're at a point where we can start to attack this sphere. Uh, again, start with your lightest marker. Think about the light source direction, light source angle, and where the highlight might actually be inside that circle. I'm just going to use my chisel end, sorry, my brush tip end. C1 and just drop in a light positional for my shadow core and then I evaluate and I ask myself is it going to give me the correct shaping and that's pretty good and the good thing about it is when I'm using this light marker is I can slowly build and widen that core value it's going to have reflected light underneath so it'll be the deepest tone in the middle of this shadow core. And that gives me, that sets me up for my next graded marker, which is my C3. So that's a pretty good start. What we have to be mindful of is that because it's a sphere, just like with the cone and the cylinder, how it rolls away from us to the left and right, this rolls away in all directions. So that core is going to turn and smoothly transition away from us. And I'm still using my lightest marker. If I make a mistake, I can easily readjust and reshape. That's why we work light to dark. As soon as I put ink here, it sets up the position of our highlight. I'm still using my C1. 
it's just a multiple pass. This is transparent ink, so the more passes we do, the darker it gets. And that's a good tip when you're selecting markers, is try and get markers, uh, say colours for example, that deepen with tone with multiple passes. Okay, and I'm just going to continue that to the edge. And that's a pretty good positional that I can build on uh, contrast on this shadow core. So now I'm going to increase the contrast in this shadow core by using my uh, C3. Go to the darkest part of your rendering. So if you make a mistake, you've got an opportunity to fix it. I get my number one and start to blend. You can see um, it's I'm getting a nice deeper core there. So from there, I'm going to push the mid-tones. And as I'm encroaching up to this position here, once I get closer to my highlight position, I'm going to be very careful in not losing white, just like what we did here and here. Okay, so let's just concentrate on this area here. That's some really nice shaping. I'm not worried about the shape of the highlight and the fact that it's so big at the moment. We're building and moving our tonal values up to get correct form. Okay, C3. I'm going to get more tonal value. I go straight back to the darkest part of that shadow core. You can see it getting darker. I'm working on proportion and width of the, let's say, the diameter of this sphere. You can see how I've broadened that shadow core. C1 and blending. So I'm about ready to commit to my darkest value, tonal value, which is the C5. But I'll step back and evaluate before I do. Here's my C5. Brush tip, start at the center, the darkest part of that shadow core. C3, blend. C1. And here I'm just going to push and soften these transitions from that mid-tone to my highlight. And you can see the deepness of the shaded parts of the shadow cores are starting to be aligned. I'm using a three here because I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of step in that transition. So I just want to soften that step a little bit. <clears throat> Take my three, uh, my one, transition, smooth and blend. And I'm coming closer and closer to setting up or continuing to build the shape and position of my highlight. Okay, here I want to soften the, um, the reflected light. So I've got a three. So I've got some pretty good shaping there. What I'm going to do now, just like what I did here, I'm taking my lightest marker and I'm going to wash over all of this. And what happened, looks, look what happens to the highlight. 
The highlight stays a highlight, but the streakiness beca becomes lesser. Okay, so I've just uh, taken a moment to evaluate uh, my shaping. And there's some areas here that I'd like to have a bit more smoother transition. So I'm going to be using my 3 and my 5. Using my 1. Okay, so I think that's a bit nicer, smoother transition. Single wash with a number one, all the way through softens even further some of that streakiness. And I think that's pretty good for our next step. So I'm going to take you through the detail phase of a rendering. White pencil on the highlight. Uh, I'm using the pencil on its side and I'm making sure that the center of that highlight is nice and white. I'm not pushing that hard, um, but I'm making sure that that highlight goes all the way to that point. Okay, and then appropriately fading that so it's a nice shape. And so some of the streakiness of that marker work, you can just knock out with your white pencil. Far side, reflected light turning away, just right on that edge, just softening. Black pencil on the shadow core. Pencil on its side, yeah? Don't catch the point. And hopefully you can see this. Just using very little of this black pencil. You have to work on your light touch. Watch what's happening on the page. Okay? And just softly transition. See how there's this step in value? Black pencil, steps gone. Minor shadow core. What I also showed on the original rendering was um, a little rolled edge on the bottom of um, this cone. So I'm just going to use my number three and just mark in a bit of a shadow because that might have a radius turning under itself. While I'm here, I may as well do that same shadow radius on the bottom of the cylinder. Okay, so I stuffed up a little bit. Instead of pressing record, I took a photograph. But um, here you can see that I've enhanced the, uh, just at that point where it turns under and it's a little bit lighter below that black pencil line, giving us an indication of reflected light and showing us a rolled uh, radius on the bottom edge of this ellipse. Not to worry, we're going to be doing exactly the same thing with the cylinder next to it. And you can see the cone and the cylinder sitting next to each other. The cone actually started off just like this cylinder little bit splotchy, um, good tonal value still, with minimal black pencil and white pencil work, bit of detail edging, it lifts the finish of that, uh, that rendering quite substantially. Black pencil, shadow core, on its side, straight through the center. Just softly transitioning with this black pencil.
Okay, that's about right. Minor, minor shadow call. Highlight, here's our white. Pencil on its side. Reflected light. Okay, now this is what I did with the underside radius. So you can see I already added my marker where this shadow core aligns to that radius turning radius. I'm just going to enhance it a little bit. Black sharp pencil, not too hard. Just to indicate that there's a turn in surface where that shadow core is. The width of this shadow core, again, Try and be consistent, accurate. On the top edge of this cylinder, that leading edge, I'd really like to have a white highlight on there, but I've got a black line from my fine liner. It's gonna be quite hard to get rid of that, um, but we'll see how we go. Um, what I will do is I'm going to darken that top surface. We can afford to do that. Right, so I'm starting at the back, because at the front, of course, is where the light is hitting that edge. Let that dry a little bit, come back and knock over that whole area. Black pencil on its side, very light. I'm just going to fade from the back and just have a smooth transition to the front. Very minimal. Don't be heavy handed here. Good thing is you can rub this out if, it's, if it ends up being way too dark. I'm going to take my white pencil and just try and pick up this leading edge. Unfortunately, that black line will have to stay. And some, some white pencils like a um, Prismacolor, it's really buttery and that's sort of great for highlight work. To enhance that, just so, show a position where that highlight might have started at this lip. And again, this black pencil, nice and sharp, is just on the area where the shadow core is. And a little bit here. Okay, there's our cylinder. Let's move along to our cube. We would generally get some bounce light on the underside of that surface. So I'm just using a C1, starting at the top of this edge. I'm just gonna move about halfway down. And that C1 is probably as dark as it can get. So I could possibly get away with using a C3. But again, I don't want to commit to such a dark tonal value if I'm gonna kill the rendering. So what I will do then is use my black pencil, and this is the beauty of using mixed media. And I'm just going to do a transitional fade, very light, starting at the top edge here. I do know that I wanna have a white highlight in pencil on this two top leading edges and the vertical leading edge. I know I'm going to deepen that top surface a little bit and I know that white pencil doesn't work well with black pencil so I'm going to address that top surface do my highlight in white and then do my black pencil so I get my C1 same as what I did here a little bit darker at the back Go over it again and bring it forward and I'll get that transition. Quite happy for you to use a straight edge on this kind of rendering. So I'm just going to use my white pencil. Again, it may not be dark enough, but that's okay. Let's just go through the motions. Nice sharp white pencil edge. Rotate your pencil 
and it keeps the point nice and sharp. So there's our highlight that we can see. And remember, it's a matte finish surface um, rendering, so it doesn't have to be super, super contrasty. Now I can come in with my black pencil and do my transitional fade. I'm going to do the same here. I can get away with having a little bit more value change just at this point. I was a bit tentative before. Let's detail the sphere. Here's the highlight. I start in the center, circles. White pencil on its side. And I'm just pressing and rotating in a circular motion. Black pencil, shadow core. White pencil. Yeah, I think that's going to be totally fine. If anything, I would soften just that back edge. Oh, it's not even an edge, but just that back area. I feel like that needs to be a bit wider to enhance that that's spherical and rolling away on that left upper area of that sphere. I think that works better. Okay, so there we have our four finished rendered views. Uh, to finish off this page, I guess, um, we will put in a background and then uh, cast shadows. Uh, we're not going to fully construct and, and plot all the points, but some sort of indication to ground these views on a surface. And the last thing we'll do is um, add some line weight variation to punch up the silhouettes of these objects and then we're done. On the original rendering, I used a B05 uh, cool color. Cool colors are better to use as backgrounds because the cool colors tend to recede and warm colors tend to come forward. There's another one here where I've just used the warm gray. These ones, this rendering doesn't have any cast shadows though. And you can see the backgrounds are actually quite loose. I don't want it to be a, a dead flat block of color. It's just there as a mechanism to ground the views on the page and to present what's most important, that's the object that you're presenting. Today, I'm going to use the BG23. That's going to be good for just this background strip. Okay, so here you can see I'm just chipping around uh, using my background color, um, just framing the outline of each of these views. And that way, when I come in to do my background fill, um, I've got a buffer to protect, say, going outside the background strip and also um, putting some color on the actual renderings themselves. Okay, so here we've got the background filled, and you probably noticed that with my marker strokes, I was trying to basically go straight up and down and keep that consistent. Um, the strokes on your background, because the background's just there to present the sketches, the renderings. We don't want to have too many crisscross or angled lines, because that'll take, that'll be a focus away from the actual um, sketches themselves. And here I've um, purposefully left it a little bit streaky and a little bit lighter as we run away from the strip left and right and really the body of color is just across the background of these images. So now I'm just going to um, project uh, some basic cast shadows. So um, we do know that our light source is coming from a direction on the ground plane and from a particular angle. So if I visualize the stick of that point, 
of this cone and my light's coming and hitting the bottom, sorry, the top of that cone, that point, and it hits the ground plane. It's going to be about here. And if I just anticipate where it actually might hit on the ground plane, let's say about here, from this tangent, I'm going to have that line. Just using a black pencil, that would be the back of my ellipse, the points about here, and that might be the cast shadow. So I'm just using the black pencil as my guideline. Okay, and then same thing if I've got the center of my cylinder, light source direction passes through the top. I do know that this has a diameter at the back. It'll project at that angle, probably about there. And light source direction will hit the tangent of this ellipse and project back somewhere about there. Squares or cubes, and we can take each of these sticks. So we've got a light source direction. The angle. Same angle. And then imaginary stick at the back ground plane, same angle, it would cross about here. Join up the dots, and there's my cast shadow. With the sphere, again, I'm just going to think about the light source direction, the angle that the light's coming from. It'll hit the diameter of the sphere and throw a shadow, something like that. I'm just gonna come in with my C3 marker and just block this in. And just to give it some depth, I'm just gonna use my black pencil and where it's closest to the object, I'm just gonna make it a little darker. And what I will do is just add a bit of definition. Okay, so quick cast shadows. Uh, last thing I'm going to do is some line weight definition. Um, you can use a fine liner, you can use a felt tip uh, like a pencil sign pen, you can use a black colored pencil. The objective is to add line weight variation and get this thing to, to pop. So, as I said at the beginning of this video, this is the first exercise of sketching Portfolio 2. This rendering will be up on the Week 6 uh, Canvas shell, and you'll be able to download the uh, layout that you can trace over um, for this exercise. Okay guys, hope that was useful, and have fun with it too. It can be challenging, but I'm hoping you'll have fun with it as well. Alright, we'll see you next time.